still not shattered. That highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. Hillary Clinton did break through the glass ceiling, so she made some mistakes, but make no mistake, she did in fact win more votes than Donald Trump. Glass ceiling? It's not like roof, but it's like glass, but it's like the roof. The glass ceiling for women in the workplace? For me, anyways, it's non existent. It should be non existent. Uh, I have personally never experienced a glass ceiling. You aren't aware of it until you hit it. I think a glass ceiling is scary. I refused to believe there was a glass ceiling for years. That's where we are. A glass ceiling is invisible ceiling that you hit in relation to your pay. De d'être promu, c'est le cas des personnes de couleur et c'est le cas des femmes. Je sais pas. Je sais pas. Le plafond de verre, moi je pense que c'est quelque chose de très très personnel. Nous c'est le plafond de béton. Hein. Ah oui, c'est vrai. <rire> Keine Ahnung. Vielleicht auch von einem Gewächshaus. Myślę, że szklane sufit to jest coś, co nie powinno być akceptowane. Klaus Lucky. Klaus Lucky. Madame ta se Klaus Lucky to jako ta handa. Look at the sky, is that right? See through, that's it. Tak jest tak. Nie jestem na żadnym razie kasą, ale luleć są i warmości w Suomisa. A si katto. Tare halu ja murta. Suomi 11 presidentti oli nainen, 11. Siihen määrittiin melkein sata vuotta. Karasnu tenjo. Ja sulle on tuojattara, kuaskuto vaikka kirjoitin katte ja muut teitä toki niin. ceiling. Does that phrase mean anything to you? I discovered it a few years ago when I stumbled upon The Economist magazine's Glass Ceiling Index. This index tracks where women have the best chances of equal opportunity at work within the affluent world. The Glass Ceiling Index compares 10 sets of data across 29 countries on higher education, parliament, senior jobs, and pay. These are pretty complicated issues, but hard to ignore. In what sense do you mean a glass ceiling? In regards to how high you can go? Normally associated with women trying to push through to get more money. At first, I was fascinated by the statistics. Now I am astonished. It is difficult for me to grasp that as women, we are still two centuries away from gender equality in pay. Two centuries? Is this a joke? Oh. I'm a filmmaker and I see the world through my lens. So I decided to travel the world and try to capture that glass ceiling on camera. I wanted to portray the different aspects of the glass ceiling index to show that the statistics are not just abstract numbers, but have real consequences in women's lives. At least, that was my plan. It took me years to find women who are not afraid of being filmed while breaking through their class ceiling. Finally, I found Rebecca. My name's Rebecca Burke. For the past three years, I've been fighting against unfair dismissal and equal pay. In 2015, I was employed by a telco giant called TalkTalk. Talk. 
I picked up the cybersecurity program post a major hack and then I deployed a full fibre network up in the city in York. I loved my job. It was a great team. In 2017, I was then fairly dismissed. It was then I also found out that I was being paid 45% less salary than the men on my team doing the same job as me. Since then, I've spent the last three years and all my life savings on fighting this case through the courts. I met Rebecca only 10 days before her tribunal started. It is her second time around a retrial. The glass ceiling is a concrete threat to many women, but to litigate in court against your former employer, a tech giant, takes it to an entirely new level. It takes courage to speak up and to stand up for yourself and for others, which is why I want to follow Rebecca's court case. Pay discrimination is the gender pay gap's dirty secret. It divides men and women across almost every workplace and every occupation. But there are many who are not aware of the bias and find it hard to believe it exists. What are the chances of Rebecca winning? When Rebecca started fighting in court in 2017, she was one of the first women taking on such a case. Since then, the journalists Carrie Crazy and Samira Ahmed have won their equal pay claims against the BBC. And the chief HR officer, Sam Walker, has won a sex discrimination case against the supermarket chain Co-op. So, Rebecca is not alone. In fact, she's meeting Sam, who is introducing her to a barrister. Hello, Rebecca. How are you doing? Great. Thanks. How are you? Yes. I'm good. I'm good. We just had a We've already reached really out to some of the women that walked with Samira yeah. before she won against the BBC and Samira herself, and we're going to try and get them to walk with you on the first day. That so would be lovely. Hopefully Carrie Grayson from the BBC. Yes. So, so I think what happens is you then get the, the employers start realising, hang on a minute, these women are all talking to each other. And that's what we need. We need that for him. Having women there that have actually gone through it and understand what I'm going through is going to be feel quite supportive to me. Yeah, so Sam said yeah. she would be willing I'm to gonna come do that. with me. And I'm going to make the notes, so it means you can focus, it means Shayla can focus. So the most important yeah. thing for you to do is look after yourself when we go in there and do your best. And it's going to be, you know, part of you might feel relieved also that finally you've been heard. Yes. Uh, you too. You're going into tribunal, and I hate to tell you this, it's theatre. It's theatre, and you are one of the main characters. And that judge and the panel, yeah, judge and the panel are the audience. And you need your audience to love you as a character. And they will make their minds up about you, and are you, Rebecca Burke, a really nasty, nasty vexatious employee who's just gold digging? and after money and, and after publicity? Or are you poor Rebecca Burke who has been unfairly dismissed, treated terribly and should have been paid the same as the men? And they will make their minds up about whether you're that horrible, nasty, vexatious person or this poor employee who's been, you know, attacked again by another big corporate and mauled by a big company. Mm. And they will decide which of those it is within the first hour of the tribunal. So I think the glass ceiling is a phenomenon that hasn't been studied in any great depth because you aren't aware of it until you hit it. It could take an expensive legal battle for you to understand that you've hit a glass ceiling somewhere or it might be immediately apparent to you but either way it hurts. Like that, I mean, this glass, <laughs> so you can see through it, like to go through it. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's like the top, 
Uh, it's an unfortunate truth in our society that half of our world is constrained by a gender bias. You might know that the term glass ceiling was invented in the USA in the late 1970s. Consultant Marilyn Lowden was the first person to coin it during a 1978 speech. A few months later, completely independent of Lowden, two women at Hewlett Packard also identified the invisible barrier. However, it was not until the Wall Street Journal published an article in 1986 that the term became popular. The class ceiling, why women can't seem to break the invisible barrier that blocks them from the top jobs. On March the 8th, 2013, to mark the International Women's Day, the Economist created its class ceiling index, detailing the complex array of obstacles that hold women back and prevent them from reaching the top of the ladder. Each year on this date, the index is updated. As you can see, America still has a long way to go. It is the only country where women get no paid maternity leave. It so happens that on the 8th March 2017, when the 5th Class Sailing Index was published, I was attending the Women's March in Amsterdam and encountered an American woman who could introduce me to the journalist Charlene hunter Galt. Charlene hunter Galt is sitting in for Robert McNeil in New York tonight, as she will be regularly from now on when either one of us is gone. A glass ceiling? There's no room to go up. It's just kind of um, what keeps women from moving up in the world. To be honest, I don't really know. The most successful folks are white men. If you're not a white man, if you're a woman or a black person, there's a... Uh... The inability to rise up to executive level. Charlene Huntercolt is an award-winning journalist and a civil rights activist. She was the first African-American woman to enroll at the University of Georgia in 1961. She wrote the book, In My Place, about her walk into history. So here we are, knocking on the door of a woman who broke a color barrier that curiously shattered all her future class ceilings. I think it's very important for young people to feel empowered, regardless of their color. I remember when uh, I was growing up in the segregated South, uh, where black people weren't allowed any of the privileges of whites, where in my school, we used to get the hand-me-down books from the white school. Our school was a black school, and we would get books that the white students had used, some of which had the pages torn out. And our black community understood what was happening, although they didn't have the legal power to do anything about it. But what they would do is they would have fundraisers where they would go out into the black community and raise money to make up for the deficits that our black schools suffered. And every year they bring everybody together in a big fundraising gala, so to speak, and whichever family had raised the most money, their child would be crowned king or queen. And there came a time my family had raised the most money. And that year, I got the Diamond Tiara and Crown Queen. Well, for the next few days, I was insufferable to my classmates because I wore that tiara on my head and they'd say, look at her, look at her. Eventually, I took it off. But the notion that I was a queen took up residence in my head and my heart and my soul so that whenever I was called nigger, when I walked onto the University of Georgia campus and they was shouting, nigger, go home, I was looking around for the nigger because I knew who I was, I was a queen. And I call that armor. And it was the people in our communities that taught us that we were as good as anybody. And so it was the armor that gave us the protective covering that we needed to meet any challenge. Now that is not to say 
we were perfect because we made mistakes. We were human. But that was the thing. They taught us our humanness, which was our first classness. I don't recall ever having any challenges to my professional work, but that's because I had no doubt. I mean, they might have been out there, but I never saw them. That's what I'm hoping we can teach our young people, regardless of their color or their sex or their sexual orientation, not to have any doubts that they can be whatever they want to be. Pick up the baton. If you believe it, say it with me. Pick up the baton. Pick up the baton. I want to hear it. Pick up the baton. Are you going to do it? Are you going to pick up the baton? This feels like a, uh, a leading question. Yeah, and you have to like break the break, break through the glass ceiling. Do you know what I mean? Sure. I've heard the term before, but I can't remember where how to describe it. It's an obstacle to um, women succeeding in the workforce that isn't there for men. Glass ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> I am surprised to discover that the UK is one of the more unequal places for working women in the industrialised world. However, there is progress. From 2017, Britain's biggest companies are legally forced to publish their gender pay gaps. Gosh, what a lot can happen in a day. <laughs> You've got a barrister. I know. You're being represented. I'm going back into... Sam doing is Rebecca's work. friend. She has recently faced a similar case herself, and she wants to help other women to get through it. Few women fight in public, simply because the stakes are too high. In my case, we've remortgaged my home. My entire savings went on this, and this is why there are so few cases that go to court, because if they offer to settle, the women will take the settlement because they can't fund the court fees. They can't and sign fund. an NDA. And, and then they make them sign a non-disclosure agreement so they can't tell other women about their case or other women at the company that this is going on. So they shut the whole thing down and keep it confidential. This is what happens. And the few of us that have decided to go ahead and fight it, we're ruined financially and we're ruined mentally by it. Mm. It's like a hate crime. Yeah, it is. Right, come in. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. You've met James and cat number one. Well, look to me, yeah, lovely way. to meet you as well. Sit down, I need to take some notes while you're talking next. So, yes. Do you want a glass of wine then? And um... The one thing I will say, and this is where lawyers and your barrister can't coach you, okay? Does it matter what you wear? Yes, it does. Every single barrister and solicitor will turn up in a dark suit with a white shirt. They won't have a dark shirt. They will all be dressed the same. They will have their uniform and they still operate in that world. We've all moved on, they haven't. So I, I fundamentally think it's really important what you wear. Oh, okay. So black boots is good because they're actually quite flat as well. No, <laughs> absolutely not. No, come on, put it away, put it away. Good. Um, navy and white. Navy and white. If you've got navy tights, navy boots. I have. Yeah. You I don't want to do too much skin. Could do. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good. Really good. Three days. Brilliant. Just um, interchange those. That's fine. Plain. Do I hide the back? Hide the back with the jacket. With the jacket. Rebecca's quite funky. She can't be funky in court. They're very good. You know, one person plus one person plus one person, it's a group of people. And I think sometimes it takes one person to take a step forward and show others that this is the right path. And I think that sometimes one person can make a big difference. But I think that the one person who is in a position to make a difference understands the necessity of having a critical mass to make a difference. You can take the first step, but it's very important to have support for that step that you took. 
people like Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi and Eleanor Roosevelt and Ida B. Wells, all are individuals, but they were able to reach people who then comprise critical mass. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Martin Luther King, I met him once and I was amazed. I was so amazed that I walked up to him and I said, Dr. King, I'm, he said, I know who you are. This was when I was at UGA. He said, and we're all so proud of you. That was a humility about him that was so impressive. Martin Luther King, who we all know and love what he stood for, didn't do it alone. One of the people who helped Martin Luther King be the man he was, was Coretta King. Here's another thing about history and discrimination. We are just now learning about so many of the women who helped change the laws that were discriminatory. So yes, individuals are important, but their importance is often predicated on their ability to bring about a critical mass of people who can then move forward to change things. Nobody does it alone. No man is an island. No man or woman stands alone. So to break through a class ceiling, you need armor. You can be the one who speaks up and initiates a change, but you will need support and others to join you. The court case starts on Monday, January the 27th, 2020. The women meet in a cafe before the press walk. Oh, I'm shaking a bit now, obviously. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Hello. Right. I, yeah, if you wouldn't mind all going before me, the, the, the photographers are congregated at the other end, but we'll stop. Um, shall I shout stop? Where are we going to follow you, not you? And then we'll stop. We should be following you. That's yeah, but way. then I'll come to the front because so, Mary wants me at the back. So, so, so where do you want us to stop? You don't, you don't need to shout stop. Maybe Biffa. Biffa. Yeah. <laughs> stop like Biffa. Go on then, ladies. Off we go. All of us. Really? Can imagine it is? Yes. I'm going to read this okay, you're statement. Just saying, just to come in. When the penny dropped that Talk Talk had been treating me so unfairly, I was shocked. Now, after two years working for justice on equal pay, nothing surprises me anymore. The cost to me, my family and my friends in getting this far has been enormous, but I'm totally committed to getting justice. I hope that by seeing this through, I will encourage other women to do the same, and the truth will speak for itself. Well done. So we register here, don't we? Yeah. And then we find out information. After the security check, the trial is in one of the rooms of Victory House. The law dictates that I'm not allowed to film in the courtroom, but I will do my best to describe it to you. The trial is public and a big crowd shows up on the first day. We sit down on different sides of the room, divided, like in a church. A small table is reserved for the cross-examination between the jury and the public. Rebecca is the first to be heard. She is not allowed to talk to anyone about her case during her cross-examination. I've not done a video diary before, but I think today I'm just going to talk about my emotions. I have no idea how I came across to the many people that were sitting in the audience for the tribunal hearing. But from my perspective, it was probably one of the most gruelling experiences of my life. Odd, abstract questions about my job and other people in the organisation who I 
didn't really know. Lots of repetition of incorrect information. Um, it felt disjointed and um, just confusing. If I felt confused, then I'm sure the judges felt confused as well, which probably isn't a great sign. But I got through it. We finished at 4.30. I've probably got a long night ahead of me and then a, a long morning before I head into the courtroom for what hopefully will be my longest day. And if it's anything like today, it will be confusing and comfortable, but it won't be long. And hopefully it'll be worth it because the truth will come out and I'll end up winning this case. Having grown up in Finland, it comes as no surprise to me that the Nordic countries are at the top of the glass ceiling index. But now I wonder, what is their secret? There's a glass ceiling. Oh. Niin kuin monella alallahan tämä lasikatto on jo murtunut ajat sitten ja tavallaan sinne on tullut jo tällainen miesten lasikatto. Joku mistä ei pääse ylöspäin. Naiset on kai aika onnellisia vielä tällä hetkellä. Ansaat, että saa vähän vähemmän rahaa ja, ja tota, olevansa <laughs> vähän niin kuin enemmän semmoisia kakkosluokan ihmisiä. Alla. Sellainen näkymätön este naisten tai jonkun muun ihmisryhmän nousue yhteiskunnallisesti. Finland was the first country in Europe to grant full rights for women to vote. The world's first female members of parliament were Finnish, elected in 1907. They were teachers, seamstresses, weavers, housemates and journalists. Iceland was, however, the first country in the world to have an elected female president, Vignis Vimborgadottir, in 1980. <laughs> að Íslendingar skuli hafa valið sér konu fyrir fórsi. 20 years later, in 2000, Tarja Halonen became Finland's first, and so far, only female president. Kun meidän pidettiin kovin suurena saavutuksena, tässä tietysti olikin, että Suomen 11 presidentti oli nainen, 11. Siihen vaadittiin melkein 100 vuotta. Niin sitten ne tytöt sanoi, pienet tytöt, naisen haluat, ne sanoi, niin miksi kesti niin kauan? Mikä takia se kesti niin kauan? Ja niistä se oli heti itsestään selvää. Mä sain tavattoman paljon kirjeitä pikkutytöitä, jotka sanoivat, että jee, että minä tahdon kanssa, että minä haluan kanssa tätä ja tätä. Tota. Sitten lopulta yksi pikkupoika kirjoitti minulle, ja se oli vuosina 89 vuotta, ja sanoi, että onko se totta, mitä likat sanoi koulussa, että ei poista voi tulla enää presidentti. Mä kirjoitin, että ei, että kummasta tahansa voi tulla, mutta se ei ole ammatti. In 2020, Finland formed a female-led government, with Sanna Marin as the prime minister. Ei, ei ole niin helpompi ajatella, että kun ennen oli, miehet oli tässä ja tässä hommassa, nyt naiset oli. Mutta sitten kun sanotaan, että ei, että nyt voi olla kumpi vaan, niin se on paljon vaikeampi ajatus kuin näistä työtä. Of course, I'm very proud that in Finland age or gender doesn't matter. I think the issues matter, not the people uh, behind the issues, the issues we are all working on. So I think everyone matters. So how has universal suffrage shaped the Finnish woman? <laughs> Ilman sitä todennäköisesti ei olisi ollut mahdollista saavuttaa niinkin nopeassa tahdissa köyhässä syrjäisessä maassa, joka Suomi oli 1900-luvun alussa, niin hyvinvointivaltion perusteita. Eli nais, naiset poliittisessa elämässä ovat aina painottaneet tätä hyvinvointia. On se sitten koskenut lapsia, äitejä, koulutusta, terveydenhuoltoa. Ja pohjoismaisessa niin kun se on sellainen vanha perinne jo hyvin, hyvin vanhalta ajalta, satoja vuosia sitten, että naisella oli oikeus lukkoihin ja avaimiin aitoissa. Siis ei tämä kotitalousvalta 
ja hänellä on oikeus myöskin siihen puoleen vuoteeseen. The law Hallonen refers to is the civil code of 1734, which prevented a man from selling a property without his wife's consent. Pohjoismaisen naisen niin perinteinen asema vahvana taloudessa nämä vaikuttajana kodin piirissä. Varmaan tulee osin luonnosta luisin ja sitten on, on tietysti kerätys sotia, johon joku pitää huolehtia asioista. On oltu merellä ja, ja kaikki tällainen. Mutta että se on sellainen asia, jossa ei ole mitään yhtä vastausta. We are back in London for Rebecca's second day of cross-examination. My name is Shayla Ali and I'm barrister. There's two ways to argue equal pay in this country. So it's either like work, which is my work was the same as um, my male comparator, which is what they call them. Um, so that could be you had the same contract or you had the same job title. And so that's called like work. Or you can argue it as work of equal value, which means even though we did a different role, um, the value of the work that I did is exactly the same as the man that was doing that job. So obviously it should be equal. <laughs> that's quite simple um, as a theory. And our law protects that. Every person is entitled to be paid equally for the work that they do. What becomes more difficult is in a lot of companies, your pay is a secret. So you're not supposed to be telling your fellow employees, oh, I get paid this much. So what I find fascinating is lots of women don't even realize that that discrimination is taking place because they don't know what their colleagues are on. Most companies, and not all, but most companies will tell you your band. And in a sense, that piece of information on its own maybe won't make the difference. It's comparing what band you're on compared to your colleagues. And this is really tricky because a lot of companies keep that private. They won't tell you that you're on this band and your colleagues on this band. So often in the cases I see, they've found out by accident that they're in a different band. But if you get any sort of inkling that something's going wrong, this is where you want to start with maybe an informal conversation with your manager. You could potentially bring up a grievance where they'll have to investigate that. Um, some signs of suspicion are perhaps you got quite a low bonus, or you didn't get a bonus, or your salary's not going up. Well, they're treating you badly during a pay review. They're being very harsh with you. Some women see male colleagues getting treated better than they are. So these are all warning signs that potentially something's going wrong. So speak up. Carrie Crazy came to support Rebecca today. She sat down boldly in front of the Talk Talk delegation. Crazy is one of the women who won her equal pay case against the BBC. She donated her backdated pay to the Fawcett Society, a charity that campaigns for gender equality and women's rights. 500 women at the BBC have been awarded rises since 2017, after making pay complaints. In her own case, painfully, Crazy discovered that highly skilled women in their 50s have the widest pay gap of all. A glass ceiling is an invisible ceiling that you hit in relation to your pay. And the fact that it's there means that you can't go any higher without some effort on your part. But then there's part of my personality that thinks where there's a will, there's a way, and if you want to break through, you can. Today is Tuesday the 29th. It's the end of the day, my first full day in court. Yeah, I'm replaying today over and over in my head this evening. I'm still under cross-examination, so I can't talk to anyone. Um, today's been a kind of depressing day for me, but I'm happy that I've told the truth to, um, in response to every question. Now I'm feeling really lonely. And 
missing the cuddles for my daughter and husband quite a lot today. Good night. Back to the glass ceiling index. Four of the five Nordic countries and two of the three Baltic states have a woman prime minister in 2021. It is quite remarkable as only 23 women sit as the head of state or government in 193 countries around the world. Estonia, however, topped them all. It was the only country in the world where both the prime minister and the president were women in 2020. Glass lucky. On glass is lucky, my Elden. It's a bit of a glass lucky, glass lucky, it's a bit of a A limit that you can break through. Yeah. Did I get that right? When Axel became a father to a baby girl, he decided to become a stay-at-home dad. It is not a common thing to do in Estonia or elsewhere in the world, except in Sweden, where close to 90% of fathers take paternal leave. Ma olen Aksel ja ma töötan muidu ettekandena, aga hetkel olen kodus Loviisaga. Mu kihlatu käib koolis, ta õppis loomaarstiks ja siis ma väga tahtsin, et ta ikkagi jätkaks, siis hoopis mina jäi lapsega koju. Eestis võib ka mees jääda lapsega koju ja see on aasta ja pool ja saab täpselt samamoodi siis panema toetust tervese aasta pool iga kuu täis palka. Kõigepealt tegelikult ma võtsin kaks nädalat isapuhkust, kuna veel töötasin ja siis ma võtsin ennast ametlikult töölt vabaks ja siis ja siis hakkasin saama isapalka pluss siis lapse toetust või. Ma ei tea ühtegi tuttavat meest või inimest, mis meeste rahvast, kes oleks järgmalt lapsega koju. In 2016, the glass ceiling index first included paid paternity leave, the only benefit aimed at involving men. Many governments offer up the three months of paid maternity leave, but only a dozen governments offer fathers two weeks paid leave from work. Five countries offer none. But companies are also starting to recognize that fathers can have a more critical job than simply being in the workplace. Better work-life policies attract younger generations. When fathers care more, women earn more. Ma otsaselt ei torma ja ei pürgi nii kõrgele ja kaugele nagu Aino. See pärast ka oli meil kasulikum mind koju jätta. See on hea kogemus olla lapsega kodus. Me oleme aega naljaga öelnud, et nüüd kui me juba varakult alustasime, et kõik kolm lastene kolmekümnendat. Et siis on hea, kasuvad suureks ja siis me ise oleme veel noored ja otsalt töödas, ma ei tea, mida see klaaslagi tegelikult tähendab. Today is the third day of the court case. Sam describes how the case has gone so far. I would say the first part has not gone well for Rebecca. Um, we have two issues at play here. First of all, we have the barrister on the other side who is questioning her. The questions are obtuse. They're multiple questions. It's not one question at a time. And Rebecca's finding it hard to follow 
what question she's being asked at any one time. They're also leading her down a trap, which is always the case when you're being cross-examined. And Rebecca is doing what we asked her not to do, which is to preempt what's the next question. So let's hope today that she has slept on it, she realises that it's not doing her any good, and we get some short, sharp answers from Rebecca today. How would you respond in Rebecca's situation? Would you know the rules of this strange game? Would you know that if you ever answered, I don't know. As honest as this response might be, it would not help you in the courtroom. Sam used to be the Chief Human Resources Officer for the Co-op supermarket chain in the UK. She found out that she was paid £1.7 million less than a man with a less important role. Sam complained. The company sacked her. Well, everything I learnt from my fight, I'm now helping other women with because it is so similar every single case. And there seems to be a toolkit. If a firm goes to a legal firm and says, oh, one of our employees is claiming equal pay, what do we do? Who are the male comparators? Quickly give them more, more things to do, make their jobs look bigger. Any projects that they've worked on in the last few years, make them sound really, really big and start really micromanaging the woman to the point where you're putting so much pressure on her she starts to not perform. So when you get to court, their stock answer is, oh, the men were in bigger jobs and they did all this extra work and she's the poor performer. And they all do the same thing. Every single one of these cases. Some on direct sex discrimination because of the bonus disparity and unfair dismissal. But fighting in court makes you lose your reputation. Sam had a very senior role. She will never work at that level in HR again. However, her experience has inspired other women to fight for their rights. I have heard of it, but I don't want to to say what it actually is. The top of your career, eh? Of het liefst al door. Ik zag posters hangen ze van het niet. Het aanrecht is niet het enige recht dat vrouwen hebben. Doorbreken de glazen bevond. In 1991, I moved to the Netherlands and became a mother in 1995. I discovered that as a Finn, I carried with me certain misconceptions about a woman's role in society. I was surprised to learn that most Dutch women give up their full-time jobs when they have families. Little did I know that I had chosen to live in one of the worst countries of the glass ceiling index. Until 1958, if a Dutch woman got married, she would be fired from her job the next day. And over the border in West Germany, as recently as 1977, a woman could not work without the permission of her husband or father. And if she did work, her salary was paid into his bank account. One of the women I interview is a Finnish expert, Mervi Lampinen. Mervi has worked as a manager at progressively higher levels in Finland, Austria, Germany and the Netherlands. Durchsichtbar ist Transparenz, wenn etwas Transparenz ist und man sich nicht mehr vor irgendetwas verstecken kann. Keine Ahnung. Verhindert, dass ich mich nach oben arbeiten kann. Eine Hemmschwelle für, Deutsche, für, für die deutschen Frauen in Führungspositionen zu kommen. Merve has built an international career while bringing up her son, which has not always been easy. Silloin kun mä muutin Saksasta, ensimmäisenkaan Saksasta, niin mä muutin Hollantiin. Ensinnäkin mä olin töissä Vilisossa kansainvälisessä elektroliikkayhtiössä. Mä tiesin, että samaan aikaan palkattiin mies ja minä samana päivänä. Meillä oli samanlainen työkokemus, samantapaiset qualifications. Ja niin mä olin korkeampi koulutettu kuin hän. Hän sai huomattavasti korkeampaa palkkaa kuin minä. Menin kysymään meidän henkilöhallinnon puolelta ja sanoin, että miehille maksetaan enemmän, koska miehet 
tarvii enemmän rahaa, koska niillä yleensä on vaimot ja lapset kotona. Aina mä käytin sitä argumenttia, että mä olen yksin huoltaja äiti, että mulla on lapsi kotona ja maksan hänen koulumaksujansa ja muuta, mutta silti ei se mennä läpi. Sitten ähm, muutin samassa yhtiössä toiseen osastoon, me toista 20 ihmistä sieltä, joita mä johdin. Ja usein kävi niin, että kun me mentiin kokouksiin, niin ihmiset kysyivät mun alaisilta, että he, minkä takia sä otit sihteerisi mukaan. Ja sitten mun alaiset sanoivat, että sori vaan, tämä on mun pomo, että ei tämä ole mun sihteeri. Nervalan pidän iso. This is she speaking, yes. Ää, mulle tietysti soitetaan kaikenlaisia myynti-ihmisiä, ynnä muita vastaavia teknisiä ihmisiä, koska mä oon IT-puolen johtaja. Ja ää, sitten mulle sanotaan, että ää, en mä halua keskustella sihteerin kanssa, että mä haluan keskustella sun pomon kanssa. I am indeed, yes. Mä sanoin niin, että mistähän asiasta on niitä asioista. Mä sanoin, että mä olen, mä olen vastuussa niitä asioista. Minä en ole sihteeri, että minä olen se oikea ja anteeksi. Sitten kysytään, että, että onko niin kuin minä yksin vai onko niin kuin minulla miehiä auttamassa minua asiassa. Okei, okay. thank you as well. Take care now, bye bye. Varsinkin aika usein se keskustelu alkaa siitä, kun ihmiset kuulee, että mun on aksentti. Ne kysyy, mistä sä tulet. Ne kertoo, että mä tulen Suomesta. Se on kysymys, missä sä oot töissä. Sitten mä olen Esossa töissä. No, a, Esossa, että millä tarkkiasemalla sä oot töissä? Ei Eso, Eso, siis mä olen Eso, tai European Southern Observatory. Ai, oot sä siivojana siellä? No, en ole siivojana. Se on jännä, että kun mä oon nainen, niin ensimmäinen on oletus, että mä oon siivoi. Siivoi tai sihteeri. Ja nämä kommentit tuli sekä miehiltä että naisilta. Että ei se ole miesten asia, tämä on ihan yhteiskunta ongelma. Naiset itse asiassa on kaikkein suurimpia, sanotaanko, diskriminoijia. Naiset myös syyllistää toisia naisia siinä vaiheessa, kun nainen tulee esimerkiksi raskaaksi. Ja hänelle kysytään, ensimmäinen kysymys on, että aah, nythän sä et varmaan kotiäiliksi tai että sä teet vain puolipäivätyötä tai vain osapäivätyötä. Sen takia, että sun pitää olla kotona. Jos naisen vastaus on sitten, sit, että hän ei, kun mä otan lapsenhoitajan tai opäärin, niin mä tietenkin jatkan mun tätä uraani, niin silloin samat ne tulee, mutta sinä olet silloin erittäin huono äiti. Tietoisuuden rakentaminen siihen, että että eihän se ole ainoastaan mies-naisasia. Sehän on yleinen kulttuurillinen asema siinä, että kuinka sä otat erilaisia ihmisiä sun firmaan tai mihin tahansa yhteisöön toimimaan. Että kuinka sä saat erilaisia ihmisiä toimimaan yhdessä, koska sitähän tämä meidän koko yhteiselämä on. The glass ceiling is embedded in our cultures and societies, in our conscious and unconscious biases. We have fixed ideas of how people in positions of power and authority should look and behave. So, how can we change ourselves? So, reflections overnight. A lot of email exchanges between Shayla and I, where talk talk have twisted some of the story. So a lot of today will be unpicking the mischievous claims, and I say mischievous claims, that Talk Talk were making yesterday about the men's roles. It's Shayla's opportunity to re-examine Rebecca. She doesn't get long to do that, to help clarify a better answer for Rebecca and help make her case a stronger case. So that's what today's focus will be about. It is Rebecca's last day of cross-examination. According to the church, the most significant disagreement is Rebecca's salary scale. He asks her why she wasn't aware of her scale. Rebecca's voice trembles. She says she didn't know what salary scale she was on. She had assumed she would be on the same pay scale as her male colleagues. I am no longer shocked when I hear that Rebecca was in band C of the salary scale, while the men were in band B and that she was also on a lower grade, grade 16 to the men's grade 17. The difference runs to tens of thousands of pounds.
After lunch, it is Shayla's turn to start cross-examining. She asks one of Rebecca's ex-colleagues if he now wondered why Rebecca was the only female program director on a different pay scale. He says no. Rebecca's former boss was even more dismissive. Rebecca was a pleasant worker, he says, but her work was not as significant as that of men. If anything, she was slightly overpaid for her role. <laughs> I was not sure you could understand it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm hopeful now. I was yeah. really not Fingers hopeful she yesterday. Came well today. She did really well this morning. Yeah. Really well. And I that shows, thinking, you know, given yeah. her the right questions, she was able to give concise answers. She probably had a nice evening too. I, I think, think so. She was in a different place today, wasn't she? Was. She was. She looked a mm. bit less, um, you know, stressed. And well, end in sight. She knew yeah. it was all going to end today. Yeah, and that's so. nice. And she can go out for a drink tonight, which is. Yeah, I, I think, think that's just her what plan. She needs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, Shall we? tomorrow yes, is indeed. another day. Battle resumes. Be Come brilliant. On, yeah. yeah. You'll go up that way to the station. Okay. See you, Shayla. The glass ceiling is often associated with managers and executives, people in high places, but the phenomenon affects all walks of life. Anna Sendalska and her husband Piotr are truck drivers. They work for a Polish company in Germany. Someday Anna and Piotr hope to return to Poland and start a family. Poland would not be a bad place to bring up your kids, especially daughters. It is one of the better places for working women, especially if you are a manager, an engineer or a scientist. In Poland and other Eastern European countries, remarkably half of the scientists are women. Nazywam się Ania Cendalska i z zawodu jestem kierowcą zawodowym. Mam 25 lat i przez 25 lat mieszkałam w Polsce. Przeprowadziłam się tutaj razem z mężem pół roku temu. Podjęliśmy decyzję o przeprowadzce z dnia na dzień. Ponieważ przez trzy lata jeździliśmy po całej Europie ciężarówką, a w tym momencie jesteśmy codziennie w domu. Mamy swoje wynajęte mieszkanie, tą samą pracę i myślę, że, że, że to jest dla nas lepsze życie. Do tej pory raz y, doświadczyłam zjawiska szklanego sufitu i to zaczęło się, myślę, że bardzo niewinnie. Piotrek zadzwonił do tej firmy, rozmawiał z jakimś mężczyzną i był skłonny nas przyjąć. E, powiedział, że tak, jasne jest praca, zapraszamy na rozmowę rekrutacyjną, e, ustalimy szczegóły. I wtedy Piotrek powiedział słowo klucz, czyli, że ja z żoną. I w momencie, kiedy ten mężczyzna usłyszał ja z żoną, e, od razu się wycofał. Powiedział, że tego stanowiska już nie ma, że nie mamy o czym dalej rozmawiać. Że, jego, że on dostał wytyczne od swojego szefostwa, e, że nie może przyjąć kobiety na stanowisko kierowcy. Ja zawsze zarabiałam tyle samo pieniędzy jako kierowca ciężarówki, jako kobieta, co mój mąż. W obecnej chwili jest tak samo. Zarabiamy dokładnie tą samą kwotę co miesiąc. A jedynie słyszałam o takich przypadkach, gdzie e, dziewczyny zarabiały połowę tego, co zarabiał ich partner, jeżdżąc razem jako zespół, jako team. Więc myślę, że jest to bardzo niesprawiedliwe i ja osobiście nie zgodziłabym się nigdy na, na takie wynagrodzenie ponieważ wykonują tą samą pracę, więc dlaczego ona ma dostać tylko połowę pensji jego. A propos zarabiania więcej pieniędzy, mam zamiar w przyszłym miesiącu zapytać szefa o podwyżkę, 
wydaje mi się, że taką pierwszą kwotą, o którą mogę zapytać po pół roku pracy będzie jakieś 50 euro, maksymalnie do 100 euro. Have you ever dared to ask your colleague how much he earns? Nie wiem, czy zarabiam tyle samo, co moi koledzy, czy to w firmie, czy ogólnie mówiąc o kolegach po fachu, czyli kierowcy ciężarówek tutaj w Duisburgu. Transparency in salaries is key to removing inequalities in pay. Men and women pay the same for a cup of coffee. And yet, for every euro that a man earns, a woman makes just 85 cents. This is the gender pay gap. Say, a cup of coffee costs three euros. Effectively, this means that for every six cups of coffee that a man buys, he will get an extra cup of coffee for free. It's almost as if there is a special loyalty card only available to men. On Thursday evening, the events take an unexpected turn in London. Hello? Hi, Mum. Should I WhatsApp you? Um, yes, you can do. How are you? I finished my cross-examination today, so that was a relief. Yeah, um, a relief. My um, barrister is happy I mean... that essentially the evidence proves an unfair dismissal. So really next week is going to be key, but we thought it was yeah. going to take a turn tonight when my barrister Shayla got a call, well, an email. It was an email from um, the respondent's barrister to ask for a without prejudice conversation okay. to see if they could settle the matter. So I haven't heard anything more than that. I need to plug my phone in because I ran out of battery, but um, we think that's a great, Please, 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 so I can say, don't be rushed into anything, okay? <laughs> Come on, everyone! Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, let's, this oh. has been a strategic plan that I think has been played out by some very clever women. I think everyone in the room took an intake of breath. Yeah, we were surprised. <laughs> when, really. you know, when Shayla started questioning because she was focused and to the point yeah. and ruthless and, you know, didn't let up. Then! And then she's a rock pilot. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Shayla. Hello. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not excited to be here. Oh, not exciting news. No, um, they basically just said it's the drop hand sort of offer, which means equal pay. They'd like me to acknowledge there was no equal pay issue to the press in a joint statement. So is this, is this them thinking they've won then? It's, oh gosh, Taylor, that's incredible. They think my evidence has gone really bad. Yeah, um, so that's what she said. And I said, well, what about the unfair dismissal? And she said, well, we think we're going to win. They think they're going to win the unfair dismissal. Oh, yeah. Uh, might be my way of saving face. Is that what she said? If I lose, then I'm going to save face by issuing a joint statement to withdraw the equal pay claim. Sorry about that. No, honestly, what a what a what a amazing twist. All right. And I, I, I'll reject it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Shada. All right then. Well, bye. You don't ring up and go, we think we're going to win, so to save you face, let's do a joint statement. Mm -hmm. They don't care about you. They don't, they don't care, care about, about you. You're saving face. You're so why would they do that? The Smearers, the Carries, the Mees, the Stacys of this care. world, even if you lost, we don't care. It's not about that, it's yeah. about supporting yeah. her for something we all believe in. Yeah, just something. But that's what happens when you get 20 blokes in a room talking about equal <laughs> pay. <laughs> Sorry, James. If they, just, right. if they just <laughs> miss the point, don't they? It's the worst over then, darling, would you? Well, I mean, well my, my cross-examination is you. over yeah. for me personally, yeah. but, you know, now it's over to my barrister to kind of take the reins and prove the light work case, so she's got a big yeah. task ahead of her, but yeah. Does she, does she seem confident? 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you never really know for certain uh, where the judges are going to land. Good on you, darling. You know, it's been a harrowing week up to now, so you've done your best. Um, it'll, be soon be it'll be soon be over. Yeah. Okay. All, all right. right. All right. Take care. Bye. See you guys. Bye bye. 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 Oh. Right. Let's go get some food. I'm starving. I am now in Paris, the city of light and architecture. Le Corbusier is one of the most famous French architects who revolutionized urban planning. What is his legacy for women? France is one of the better countries for the working woman and sits at the top of the class saving index alongside the Nordic countries. C'est quelque chose qui empêche les femmes d'accéder à des postes à responsabilité, en particulier grâce à des stratégies masculines de cooptation et d'entre-soi masculin, qui empêche les femmes d'accéder aux au plus hauts postes gradés, que ce soit en politique ou dans l'entreprise. Et euh, moi, je préfère appeler ça euh, le plancher collant que le plafond de verre. One way of breaking through a class ceiling is to start your own company. I have seen many women from various professions do that, including architects. Je m'appelle Françoise NTP. Euh, je suis d'origine camerounaise, mais je suis arrivée à Paris quand j'avais deux ans. Et j'ai grandi à Paris, j'ai fait mes études aussi euh, à Paris, des études d'architecture. En fait, je suis devenue architecte un peu par hasard. J'avais en fait l'idée d'être plutôt architecte d'intérieur. Et j'ai en fait eu, entre guillemets, la chance de me tromper d'école quand je me suis inscrite pour mes études. Et ça m'a plu tout de suite. Donc aujourd'hui, j'ai remonté ma nouvelle agence depuis début 2018. Avant, j'avais une agence pendant 18 ans avec un autre architecte et j'ai décidé à fin 2017 de voler de mes propres ailes et donc de monter mon agence en tant qu'indépendante. Et j'avais vraiment envie de, de plus euh, me développer personnellement et de me refaire une nouvelle histoire en fait. Et je me trouvais que j'avais encore une nouvelle vie en au moins 20 ans, voire plus euh, d'activités devant moi. Donc c'était le bon moment pour le faire et pas dans 5 ans ou dans 10 ans. Le plafond de verre, moi je pense que C'est quelque chose de très très personnel et je pense que sans m'en apercevoir, effectivement, j'ai dû, j'en ai vécu en n'ayant plus en fait la même motivation et je trouvais que c'était pas normal en fait euh, au bout de tant d'années de sentir ça. Françoise meets a colleague Anne, who also started her own company and an association that fights against gender discrimination in architecture. Tu as vu là, il y a 57%, les femmes gagnent 57% de ce que gagnent les hommes, à peu près moitié moins. Car de salaire aussi, c'est parce que les agences tenues par des femmes sont plus petites, elles ont accès à des commandes qui sont moins rémunératrices. Quoi, les femmes ont du mal à atteindre ces commandes-là. Et voilà, mais toi, tu, toi, tu arrives un petit peu quand même. Moi, j'y arrive. Euh, J'essaye d'y arriver, ouais. je continue à me battre pour ça, donc je continue à, à répondre à des candidatures de projets d'envergure. L'enjeu, après, c'est vrai qu'il y a encore beaucoup de clients qui ont un peu ce, ce stéréotype de se dire que, bah, effectivement, les femmes architectes ne peuvent pas gérer des gros projets, mm -hmm. ou en tout cas pas toutes seules, ouais. donc il faut toujours euh, les associer à, à d'autres agences. On a beaucoup appris l'architecture avec ces ordres oui, du module. C'était basé sur euh, oui, des sur... mesures... Euh, Basé déjà sur des mesures de l'homme et oui, pas oui. des femmes. Le module or, c'est un, un homme de 1m83 avec, en bonne santé. Nous, c'est le plafond de béton. Hein. Ah oui, c'est vrai. <rire> oui, oui, le plafond de béton. En architecture, on ne parle pas de plafond de mer, on parle de plafond ouais. de béton. Même si j'adore le béton. <rire> After a night of ups and downs, Another turn of events awaits next morning. 
there is something in the UK law called a data subject access report. It's the first thing you ask for when you're thinking of taking an employer to court for any reason. You ask them to produce all the data they have in the company that is relevant to you as an individual. Anything where your name is mentioned, anything that would be in your personal file, any emails where you're mentioned, and obviously what that includes is any emails that you have sent using your company email address. TalkTalk Talk uses an old email as new evidence against Rebecca. In this email, Rebecca had asked about pay skills in 2015, so they claim that she had been aware of the company's pay grades, contradicting what she has said in the courtroom. To her horror, Rebecca is summoned for questioning. Now, TalkTalk Talk is a communications company. If any company could actually search their email system to find emails that exist with someone's name on, it's TalkTalk. Talk. They've known about that email for at least two and a half years and they have deliberately not given it as part of that data subject access request. Rebecca was very open and said, now I've seen it, of course I remember it, you know, this is five years ago, I completely forgotten. And fundamentally she doesn't believe she's a liar. That cut her to the core. And she just completely broke down in the toilets afterwards. When we eventually got her out of the toilet, she was shaking. I cannot believe that they have made me look like this person that I'm not. To then hide and withhold key evidence that you yet... The night after the cross Until 10 o'clock, and after my, after my witness state, my cross-examination is finished, until 10 o'clock the night before their witnesses come on is just out of order. And, also, and you, can, you can get that to the press. They questioned you knowing that document existed yep. because there was one of their pe people in the room, in the room that knew about it smiling away when you were being questioned. So it wasn't that she realised and remembered the document because of the questioning. She knew they were going to hand it in after they'd asked you that questioning. It was entrapment. Yep. Yeah. Yeah? And that's what you talk to the press about. OK. Uh, but that's all after this, and when you, you sue them for breaking the law on uh, DSAR. Yeah. Yeah. The likelihood now of being able to prove the like work or equal pay claim is very slim because Talk Talk have had more airtime about the jobs, and it is very hard for Shayla to cross examine them about their jobs because when Rebecca was asked about their jobs her answers were I don't know. So Shayla can't cross-examine on an answer that was I don't know. So it's hard, it's a really really hard case to win now. It was a long night last night cross-checking witness statements with my witness statements and preparing some cross-examinations for Shayla. Um, so I got about seven hours sleep, which was really quite good. In the middle of the night, I woke up and had to write things down, but then I managed to get back off to sleep again. So yeah, I'm feeling that I'm recovering and I'm still hopeful, despite everything that's happened, that we've got some fair judges who will recognize um, the entrapment that Talk Talk laid down last week for me. I'm sure it's not an unusual thing, I'm sure Lots of other women and people that are discriminated against also have these kinds of um, issues through their court cases. And so I'm just going to ride it through and keep on fighting and hope that in the truth, that the truth will prevail. One of my last travels brings me to the land of the rising sun. Japan is one of the least equal countries for the working woman in the industrialized world. I think that in Japan, the glass is a little bit 
低くてそれがコンクリートみたいに硬くて下の方にあるなという。Miyoko Kojima used to be an engineer in an electronics company. It took her 30 years to recognize that there was a glass ceiling she couldn't break through, so she changed her career. My name is Kojima Miyoko. My job is to be a consultant in the diversity and inclusion consultation. どこにでもガラスの天井が存在しているっていうことに気がついたのは本当にこの数年のことですね。はい、えっと屋根屋根があるところで止めてもらうことできます。おはようございます。お集まりいただいてありがとうございます<笑>で当然あの別にダイバーシティだから女性だけ、ね、女性活躍だけではないっていうのは皆さんも重々承知してると思うんですけども、まあ、今日は特にあの女性の方の活躍を意識した回ですので皆さんおはようございますおはようございます149カ国中1位というのは、えー、男女が平等であるっていうそのランキングなんですが、はい、聞いてみます。日本は50位だと思う方、はい、半分以上ですね。110位だと思う方、はい、えー、80位と110位が多かったですかね。えー、そして正解がある質問でした。難しいなと思っているのは、私たちが。自分で勝手に作っているガラスの天井があってそれを壊すのが一番難しいなって感じてます私が取り組んでいるのは自信が持てなくなるような原因を解決しようとしてるんですよねだけどその逆もあって女性が自信を持てば他のことが解決できるっていうこともあるうん、新しい空気とか新しい風がこう吹いてくる状態を作りたいから、うん、だからやってるのかなと思います。Shane has got the impossible, almost impossible job of cross examining eight witnesses in about as many hours in the courtroom. So, fingers crossed, she,、um, she gets there. Anyway, see you on the other side. So, this is Monday of week two. So far, it's not looking good for us, but if Shayla can ask the right questions in the next two days, we could turn it around. We know Rebecca's got a case, we know she's got a strong case, we've just got to prove it, and it will all come down to Shayla's performance in terms of her questioning, and also whether their witnesses are good witnesses, credible witnesses, or weak witnesses. And we hope at least one of them's weak and we can find some chinks in their armour. Shayla questions Rebecca's ex colleagues about their jobs. They all seem to know their band and grade, unlike Rebecca. I wonder what motivates someone to testify against a former colleague. Could it be money? <sighs> How are you feeling? Yeah, one more day. One more day. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah, you the court case is finally over. Making this film has made me reflect on my own experience with the glass ceiling. Like Rebecca, I once found myself in court. This was to do with my debut film in Finland, under different circumstances and law. But certain things are universal. Whatever the outcome of Rebecca's trial, she will find that she has broken through her glass ceiling, as I did through mine. After my trial, I started my own company, which allows me to make the films I make today. Paradise. They're like their yogurt drinks. A berry. Paradise. 
Mm. And you've done no. your absolute best. Well, yeah. You have. Debatable, but... You have. Come no, on, you, have. you got through it. Cheers. Yeah, well but done. I did get through it. You Cheers. are, you're here. Thank you. Well done. You're living breathing. Thank you, all of you, <laughs> for your you support. Well. Thank you. <laughs> Because yeah, I wouldn't, you, I wouldn't Sheila, have done it. Stepping in last minute. Either. That's I don't think really. I'd have got to today if I was on my own. Yeah. Quite frankly. I happen yes. to agree. You wouldn't have done. <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky to work for some big employers like Unilever, like the BBC, where I just kept getting promoted. So I've worked my way up all through my career, and I refused to believe there was a glass ceiling for years because I'd been fortunate enough to work for companies that hadn't stopped me until I got to the co-op. And then it was a really big aha moment. So had I broken through the glass ceiling? Yeah, in theory. I was in the most senior HR role in the company. I was the most senior woman in the company. And I was one of eight people running that company. So. Where's the glass ceiling? And then you realise the guys are being paid more than twice you what you are. So you may have a seat at that table and you may think you've got a voice at that table and you may be working every bit as hard, if not harder than some, and then you realise they're being paid twice as much as you. There's your glass ceiling. I wish. I could tell you that the story of Rebecca's court case had a happy ending. The court case ended on the 7th of February in 2020, and it was quite shortly after that that we, as an entire nation, locked down because of the respiratory virus COVID, and um, I lost the case. The person responsible for Rebecca's unfair treatment has come to become a global HR director overseeing the pay conditions for hundreds of women. So we're again entering into another lockdown here in the UK in January 2021, um, which has given me a bit of time to reflect on the past year. Rebecca is doing a PhD in equal pay. I can forgive the people that did this to me I can forgive the corporations and the culture that allowed it to happen. I can forgive our tribunal court system for letting me down, but I can't walk away from what I now know without trying to put it right in some way. It's so important to listen with empathy to people's stories like this so that we can understand how to help them and protect the women and girls in our future from the same harm. Many women throughout history have never been given the opportunity to voice their stories and what happened to them and I feel this is an important part of our collective history um, and a, an important part of finding a solution in the future. In March 2020, I travelled to Paris to attend the Women's March. It was a week before the first lockdown of the coronavirus pandemic. Sadly, the clock then started ticking backwards for working women. COVID-19 is causing a she session, a recession that affects women disproportionately. And working mothers, women in low-paid jobs, and young women are especially hard hit. Remember, Women were already 200 years away from economic equality before the pandemic. Well, that number is only increasing now. I mean, what can I say? 
My astonishment at these statistics is turning to horror. We really can't wait that long. In 2021, Rebecca returned to the corporate world as regional director in a new tech company. I was happy to find out that her former colleagues from TalkTalk Talk, that had supported her through her ordeal helped her to return to the job she was good at in the first place. You see, we need men to support us. This is not a woman-only fight. This is an ongoing fight for us all. We owe it to women like Rebecca, Sam, Carrie and Zamira, the ones who risked their careers by standing up for us and for the next generations. One plus one plus one is a group of people, remember? Will you pick up the pattern? Here we stand, we're 108 years ago, at another inaugural. Thousands of protesters tried to block brave women marching for the right to vote. And today, we mark the swearing in of the first woman in American history elected to national office, Vice President Kamala Harris. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Kamala Harris, broke the second highest glass ceiling for women and women of color. So someday, a woman will be the President of the United States. I think that what we're seeing is a younger generation which is clearly energized. Any black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president. So at my age, 76, I plan to keep on keeping on as long as I'm around. And I also believe that the younger generation should embrace my generation because we know a few things. You are not fighting a battle that hasn't been fought before. And you you have to, as we used to say back in the civil rights days, you have to keep on keeping on. You can't drop the ball and leave it on the floor. You have to pick it up and keep bouncing it. And so I think that we're in a cyclical period now where women are beginning to assert themselves, asking for equality, equal pay, equal rights, and equal places. So I don't have any doubt in my mind that as ugly as this period is, we are going to survive and conquer and progress.